You know, when I'm traveling on the road and I'm lying in my hotel room late at night, I'm kind of cruising around social media. Sometimes it's dangerous, sometimes it's good. And thanks to social Instagram, to be specific, I got to meet this young lady, Emma, Emma de Groot. I, I, I'm assuming I'm saying that correctly. Is, is that the correct pronunciation? That's how we say it in Australia. They probably say it differently in Holland, but that's how we say it in Australia. <laughs> well, you know what? I should have double checked this before I hit record, but you know what? Why not just dive in? Uh, where I'm from in South Africa, it's very, very Dutch. It would be de Groot. So, yeah, that's, uh, the, yeah, that's how the, they would say it there. For the Canadians, for the Americans, for the Aussies, that would be hard for you to guys to, to pronounce. Yeah. Well, look, it's so good to have you. I was glad I found you. I thought some of the stuff you've been putting out there has been sensational. And um, so I just want to introduce you to the world, please. Why don't you tell us a little bit about you before we dive, dive into the golf tips? Uh, yeah, so originally from Australia, I grew up there. And then once I finished high school, I went to college. I played college golf at the University of Tennessee, Chattanooga. I'm going to interrupt you because you're being very modest. I've read about you. You were the number one <laughs> ladies amateur in Australia while you were doing. I was. Yes, right, okay. I, I was the the number one ranked amateur in Australia for a while, which was which was really cool. Um, and it's just unfortunate that you know in Australia, golf and education don't go necessarily together. You have to, if you want to go to the university, if you want to get a degree, you've kind of got to do the two separately. And that was kind of originally my plan, I was just going to go to university and keep kind of following the Australian path until I got the opportunity to go to college in the States. And, you know, when I was talking about it with my parents, we sort of figured, well, why not? You know, it's, uh, if you don't like it, you can always come home, but you may as well, may as well give it a try. So the first time I actually ever went to America was to live. I went there, I flew over with my parents and my grandparents and they left me in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I Started to question what on earth I was doing with myself. I was about to say, I mean, I'm a South African guy, born, ended up in Columbus, Georgia, which in many respects, I mean, we're only about three hours down the road from where you were in Chattanooga there. Um, yeah. It, it was like an eye popper. So, so let's make oh, a yeah. lesson out of this for the aspirant international golfer, maybe another sporting code, whatever the case might be, who gets the chance to come over here to play some college golf or college athletics. What's the advice you would give them? I just, I mean, and I, I tell every junior that I work with, everyone that I can, you have to try it. I mean, it's, it can all depend. Your experiences can all depend on your teammates, the school, your coach, whatever it might be. Everyone's experience is going to be different. For mm -hmm. me, I grew up always playing team sports and I love the team environment. And so then you, you go to golf and it's very individual you oh, might right. make some teams here or there but you're you're on your own so much and so to have an opportunity again at a high level to play as part of a team I just think is is such a a rare opportunity and then even after college same idea you might make you know if, if you're one of the best out there you might make some teams here and there but you're on your own for for the majority of your career so you know I I would I would tell anybody to give it a go Worst case, you you have an experience. Best mm -hmm. case, you get an education. You make you know you make new friends. You meet people, and it's to me, it's something. It was a scary step to take, but I don't regret it for a second. You end up not going home. I've got countless because I was a college go golf coach for a while. I've got countless golfers who would come over here from Australia, South Africa, South America, even um, UK. I've got some German folks, uh, even yep. Koreans who would come over here, and the next thing they're staying uh, and. You know, you come over and it's you got this trepidation and it's like, oh my goodness, what now? You know, it's like yeah. wow. And the next thing it becomes home. It does. And and I think too, I was lucky Chattanooga is a relatively I mean, it's not a small city necessarily, but the school was pretty small. And so I come from a, a relatively small town in Australia. So I think if I was thrown into a University of Georgia or some huge school where I was just one of you know, thousands and thousands of people and one of 15, 20 people on the golf team, I don't know that I would have done so well, but I think being part of part of a small school gave me that similar kind of small town vibe that I was used to and it, it helped me settle in. And then, you know, for for us at, at college, the, the year I started was actually the first year that the program, well, it, it kind of, it used to exist and then it right. fell away, then Title IX brought it back. So we were full of international team members for, for the majority of my time there, which was such a cool kind of experience as well. 
and you were a stud there too. Uh, had six wins, <laughs> I believe it was. Uh, yes, I've been reading your bio. You set all sorts of conference and school records. Um, again, quickly, the lesson for the golfer over there, because it is a scenery change, and that's the thing that I would highlight, it's that different grasses, different temperature. Diff- I mean, s- some folks are coming from metric to yards. It's all weird. So, yeah. so what advice would you have for them? I mean, again, you just have to you just have to embrace it. I think if you spend too much time focusing on the differences and and trying to make them similar to what you're used to, I think maybe you can kind of get stuck in a bit of a almost like a bit of a rut in that sense. I tried really hard to embrace everything mm-hmm. that I could, learn what I could. Um, even for me, my college golf coach, she was from Scotland, so she was big on teaching you how to play all sorts of different shots around the green that I never in a million years would have even thought, yeah. you know, thought to try. So I, I tried to take it all in my stride. And again, I think, I think I was lucky to be part of a smaller school because it gave me, it kind of helped build up my confidence a little bit. Um, and then, yeah, I was lucky to get some wins early and kind of kept it, kept it rolling, which was really nice. Well, you parlayed that into a career in the pros for a while, played the Symmetra tour, played the LPGA in 2015. Um, it's a big jump from college to the pros. Yeah. It really is. No matter whether it's the PGA Tour or the LPGA or uh, Europe, wherever you're going, it's just a big jump. What would you say for the aspirant golfer listening to this, who's good in college, now they're going to take the next step? What are the separators you encountered? Well, what are these? What are the pros, the good pros, just do differently? I mean, A, I think that there is, there's an inherent self-belief that they have that you and I shouldn't say inherent because I I'm sure it's something that could be to be learned and 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 you could you could work on in that sense but for me I've always been unfortunately a little bit of a self-doubter and you yeah. there's no room for that out there you know people are are cutthroat think you have to be you have to be really organized you have to know what you need to do for your body what you need to what you need to eat, what kind of golf clubs you need to play, what kind of, you know, what, how you perform best. And I think that there's, you know, and I'm not, not old by any means and I haven't been out of it for that long, but there's just way more data and metrics out there now that you can even use to start to analyze your performance and and where things are, you know, where you may be falling short. Um, But then it all comes down to one, it comes down to money. It comes down to if you can find yourself a sponsor, it makes your life a lot easier. And can you, keep your your body healthy for you know that sustained period of time especially on the mini tours so on the the Symmetra tour you're well for me you know I was driving between most events and stuff's hard you know that it's 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 hard on your body it's hard on you know it's hard on your golf swing and 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 they're the kind of things for me that you know if I go back I I wish I took better care of myself physically in that sense you know got in the gym a little bit more I wish I Mm-hmm. found a sponsor not that you can just wish that that would happen but you know there there's little pieces and sometimes the chips have to fall your way and, and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't but you really have to embrace every opportunity embrace every pro-am all those sorts of things that you do, you know you never know where anything could lead i guess yeah i i want to build on that and just get your view to cap it a little bit um i think the first thing that aspirant professionals should realize is you're a business um mm-hmm. and and here's the thing. I'm not trying to talk people off the turning professional ledge here, but I would say, certainly in my experiences on the, on the tour, 97% of the folks, it's a grind and a struggle. Two, 3% of them are living the glamorous life. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Do you agree with me? What it's, is it the same deal in the LPGA? Oh, yeah. I mean, and it's, to be honest, you know, obviously prize money purses it's probably there's very few that are you know flying in private jets to different events and and whatever it's it's it is 100 percent a grind and you have to be strong enough to to put up with it and hats off to to some of the girls out there that you know i used to play with and they're still they're still out there they're still grinding they still obviously have that hunger and that desire for me it just it all got a little bit too much but it's certainly not you know, you watch full swing, let's just say, and you see Jordan and um, 
JT flying to to play a practice round and then flying back in the afternoon. I tell you, we certainly weren't <laughs> we certainly weren't doing that. We were we were trying to decide if we should pay the thirty bucks to take a cart for the practice round or if we should just walk. It was uh, it's just a different different beast out there. And um, like you said, you, you never want to talk anybody away from from chasing their dream, but you also have to understand everything that comes with it. And you do you do have to approach it like a business. You you can't approach it like oh look at me, I get to travel around, you know, doing whatever. You have to be very regimented and and that's kind of I think the only way that you'll you'll make it out there all right ladies and gents all you aspirant professionals Emma's got you she's going to go <laughs> but the rest of us now um well you've you've sort of said why you, you turned to teaching now you're an Australian who went to college in Tennessee who now lives in Canada giving golf lessons and you're turning all <laughs> sorts of heads including mine with some of the stuff you're doing um quickly to the teaching was that just a natural sort of a path in your career i think so i think you know when i first stopped playing professionally i actually didn't want anything to do with golf at all i felt pretty kind of defeated by it i guess you would say so i took some time away from the sport at all i just you know i had a random job at a gym selling gym memberships just very mm -hmm. not golf related at all and then i remember it was about probably Eight, eight months or so after that, I was watching the Masters. The Masters had come, you know, back around and we are Masters obsessed. We set up four or five televisions in the house and we we don't go to work. Like we are fully invested in everything that happens with the Masters. And so um, I was watching it and I found myself getting a wedge and starting to like hit some little uh, shots here wow. and there just in the basement. And I was, and then instantly I was, I was back again. And so, and I realized, you know, I, as much as I had felt defeated by it at the time, golf has been the reason for so many things in my life and I'm so grateful for it. And I also felt that, you know, I, I feel like I have a pretty good way with people and a, and a pretty good way of kind of trying, like making people feel quite comfortable when we're on the lesson tee and that sort of thing. So it did, it just kind of naturally sort of morphed into that as I got, you know, I started back working in a pro shop and then I thought, I don't feel like I'm, you know, once, once a, not necessarily an athlete, but you know, you, you become, in order to get to a professional state at anything, you obviously, you don't like to settle. So I felt like I was settling and I always wanted to get a little bit better and a little bit better. And I'm still the same now. And um, it just kind of led me down this road to to teaching and then starting my own business teaching now with two, which has been excellent. Awesome. Um, it, it's great to see. And and for me, you know, I'm 53 and holding, I think it is, you know, I've been around <laughs> the some. Um, I've I've spoke been fortunate to speak to a number of great golf teachers, you know, Mount Rushmore of them, if you will. And all of the really good ones bring a real playing element to me, to instruction. Yeah. It's not all technique. And when I was looking through all of your stuff, it sort of seemed that way to me too, where you've got some fantastic ideas on drills, which I'm going to quiz you on a little bit. But then there's always this playing element to the thing. And that to me is kind of where the sweet spot is. And, and that's how you seem to want to hit it. Yeah, and I think... You know, not necessarily that you have to be able to play good golf in order to teach golf. I think you can be very well versed on the theory of the golf swing and give a really good golf lesson. But I also think for me, my students like to to play golf with me. They like to, I think that there's a level of credibility that comes with knowing that, you know, your teacher can kind of do a lot of the things that they're telling you to do, I guess, in that sense. And I also think it's important to maintain a high level of playing even now because I want my students to know whether they're young aspiring juniors or whether they're you know just an average golfer trying to get a little bit better I want them to know that I'm still working towards the same thing you know and nobody ever perfects the golf game and I still work on my golf game just like they do theirs and the the amount of effort it takes I think sometimes people maybe don't realize how much effort making a swing change actually <laughs> takes and I think that's why uh -huh. It's kind of not necessarily a linear curve towards improvement, but I think that them seeing me putting in the effort as well is a uh, kind of a draw, a draw card sometimes, I guess. Yeah, I'm being completely self-serving here and I'm stalling with these tips <laughs> because look, the proof of what she's saying is when I asked Emma for a little summary as to where we were going to go, so I don't seem like some numbskull who's just kind of looking at the guest, she sends <laughs> me this list of stuff, golf drills, which I asked for. And then she goes, perhaps we should also do these short game things over here, which told me that you were really into the scoring. But I'm going to ask you this first. Um, I'm related to some good golfers. One of those is my daughter, my oldest, okay? Um, 
and she seems to be averse to repetition and doing something because mm -hmm. you talked about practice and you know improvement's not a linear deal it's variable at best yeah. so please speak to so i can get this from a, a credible well-versed women's golf instructor so i can play it back to my daughter right <laughs> the value of repetition and practicing on the range doing drills which we're going to speak about uh, in order to hone one's craft unfortunately it is a <laughs> I guess you could call it a necessary evil. There's no way that you can, it doesn't matter what it is. You know, you think about when you were a kid learning to walk, you didn't just get up one day and start walking. You got up and then you fell and you got up and you fell and you fell and you fell. And then eventually we can walk now, right? So it's it's this motor control pattern that we have to develop. And then if you've started to develop some maybe not so helpful habits, you've also got to work those out. And and your body's always going to want to go back to what's comfortable. I think we all have sort of a natural swing DNA, something that feels really good. And sometimes it's not necessarily the most functional. Um, and it does, it takes, it not only takes reps, but it takes really slow motion reps and you've got to break it down and you've got to build the, uh, you've got to build yourself back up again to, to the walking analogy. You know, you crawl, you walk, you run, you sprint. It's not just get up and sprint. So Sometimes for me, I'll spend 15 minutes in a lesson trying to kind of tell somebody that, you know, because because we'll do a drill or we'll do a, a, a practice swing and, and then they'll just want to get a ball already, Driver. you know, yeah, and it's like, yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, you know, I, I'm I'm even known to to put the bucket of balls kind of far away and I'll give you one and then we'll do some practice swings and you got to go over and you get the other one and, and you come back <laughs> and we hit that because you can't just, you know, and it's it's the same concept there too. You know, yes, you need repetition, but I'd also sooner somebody give me one hour of really focused, dedicated practice and maybe hit 30 golf balls and come to me and say, I hit a hundred golf balls yesterday, mm -hmm. but it was just rake and rake and slash. Yeah. yeah. So unfortunately, yeah, let your daughter know that it's it's necessary. <laughs> it's necessary. Isabel, not if, when you listen to this, I did <laughs> not brief Emma on what to say. Hey, I just want to no. go on that. To, uh, the slow motion stuff, I think, is absolute. We just released a podcast with Joe LaCava, who's a well-respected, you know, well-known caddy who's worked for all in mm -hmm. Saturday, including Tiger Woods. And we spoke about how he practiced, and he told this really cool story. I'm wasting time now, but I must share it with you. How he had been working for Dustin Johnson for a while. And DJ wasn't putting that well, so they were up in New Jersey. So DJ's like, look, just meet me on the putting green. I'm going to practice putting today. So they met at 9, and they basically putted till about 3 p.m., Yeah, okay? just okay. putting. And so many years later, Joe's on Tiger's bag. Joe tells Tiger the story. Tiger's like, hmm. So anyway, they're preparing for an event in South Florida, and Joe goes down there to Tiger's home, and he says, look, I'm going to go and check out the golf course. I'm not available today. Tiger's like, that's great. I'm going to work on my putting today. So Joe apparently tells me on the show, you can go and download it, folks. He goes, I show up at Tiger's house at seven and he's on his backyard putting green already. Joe goes, he leaves to go to the golf course, which is a good hour and a half with traffic away, walks the golf course, comes back, hour and a half, same traffic, gets there, and there's Tiger Woods still on the putting green. And Joe goes, Tiger surely you weren't out here the whole time. And Tiger goes, no, I took about 10 minutes for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Right. So, yeah. so with slow motion and with repetition, look, I've now backed Emma up in what she was saying. You don't okay. need backing up with this stuff. You've got five tips, five drills people can do just to help their golf swings improve and to help ball yeah. striking. And I love the way as I've looked through these, they kind of all touch on areas of the golf swing. But let's yeah. kick it off with the one that brought you to my attention. I was following you, but all of a sudden I was like, I've got to feature this, this woman. Um, and you call it three-part shallow. Three -part. I want you to demonstrate that and talk about it. Because right now on the internet, if you type in golf instruction, you're getting two things, early extension and shallowing. And everyone's talking about it. And you've yeah. the, to me, you've the one, you're the one who's done the best job of explaining how to get this correct. I appreciate that. And yeah, you're right. It's it's funny. They're the they're the buzzwords for sure. They're the they're the things. And and people will come to me and they'll say, you know, uh, you know, I'll, I'll I'll introduce myself, but they'll introduce themselves, I'll ask them what's happening with their golf swing, and they'll say, 
oh, well, I need to shallow the club better and I'm early extending and I'm, and they're, they're throwing all these words at me and instantly I'm like, okay, this person has been on Instagram a lot. Uh-huh. Like they have, they've kind of run the gamut. It's not worked. So now they've come to some in-person instruction, but yeah. So essentially the, the three part shallowing drill is, so I'll jump up here for those that are watching. Okay, while Emma's doing this, she's situating folks. If you're listening on audio, you can go to YouTube. Um, just search Mark and Woman there, subscribe. You can check this out. You can also go to her Instagram handle, which I will share in a bit because I don't have it handy. Okay, but uh, while you're doing this, I want you to show, and then I'm going to kind of put this, use my radio voice and describe what you're doing too. Okay, so you're going to describe it? No, well, you do it, so I'll just add a little bit. Okay. Okay, so we're basically holding the golf club vertically up and down, kind of at our side. For me, I'm a right-handed golfer, so I'm holding it in my right hand. Right. right, And then I'm just kind of letting it fall and make a circle. So the circle right. that Emma's making it, she's allowing this club to fall backwards. So if you're looking at the club to your right-hand side, right-handers, it's basically going clockwise. And yeah. you're letting it fall, but then you're not letting go of the club. You're just allowing it to sweep back, so you're recatching it. And I think that that's... That's something that is so important for people to feel because sometimes the harder you try and change something, the tighter that you grip the club. The tighter that you grip the club, the more it steepens, the more you early extend, the more you do everything that you're trying not to do. Mm-hmm. So it basically brings the softness back into kind of your hands and, and your shoulders, your arms. You can't do this. If you're strangling the golf club, you cannot make this motion and add to this folks gravity is very reliable okay oh (laughs) yeah it works and what emma's doing there you feel the weight of the club head too and that thing wants to go to the ground if you allow it to do so in the dance way yeah that's always you know the the club head weighs more than the shaft does right so if we just incline it in a certain direction it's going to want to fall in that direction right which is essentially what we're looking to do right so we let it fall and then after you've done that a few times to where you kind of get that feeling, then we stop it where it's basically horizontal to the ground, uh-huh. then kind of start to rotate to where impact would be, but a little bit higher. So watch right, so them has done that too. And this is what I absolutely loved. Um, she's allowed the club to fall and she's grabbed it. And the club basically is on the horizon line and her elbow is kind of around her waist. So now she's created an environment where the shaft is parallel with the ground. And from there, mm-hmm. she just rotates horizontally to contact. Now, contact is basically belly button high as you're doing it. Okay. Yeah, you got it. But the nice part about it too is as you do it, you want to sort of bring the club around so that when you get to belly button height, but impact, the golf club, the face of the club is actually square. It's facing the target because again, all these buzzwords of shallowing and, and all these drills. But if I just do that and pull this club, the club face is so open that I would never fix my slice. Yeah, I love you. I'd actually written <laughs> down, if I, proof, there it is in my notes, you can see, I'd written down <laughs> face alignment question mark because I got to tell you, I've seen thousands of golfers and I'm sure you have, be like, well, I want to hit a draw. And so I've got to hit it inside out. So they get this thing going inside out, but the face is wide open. Now their slices, st- yeah, yeah you, you're showing, their slices are now starting right instead of left and they've gotten worse in the interest of getting... Mm-hmm. So then they end up aiming further left, yeah. trying to swing, and it's and that's again why. Don't get me wrong. I think I think drills are fantastic, and, and and looking them up is great. But only if you have enough education or enough knowledge to understand all the pieces that have to be in place. And that's again why you know letting this club fall, but also as you bring it around, making sure that that club face is square to the target or square to your target line when you get to what impact would be. Mm-hmm. It is is vital because again, that's going to help you when you put two hands on the club. Feel what that all sort of needs to do as it starts to work around. Okay, so now we've gone from the little I call it like the Ferris wheel whirly bird thing, just for the run. Yeah. So you've caught it. Now it's at waist high. Now you just rotate your body and you show up with a face square in front of you. Now yeah. the club is not on the ground. Now we get it to the ground with some uh, forward bend and some side bend, which everyone also yeah. wants to do as well on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, and that's it. Yeah, exactly. So we're kind of putting, just as it's called, that three-part challenge, or we're putting it all into play and getting ourselves back down to impact, but we're doing it in three different ways, right? So we're feeling the club fall, we're feeling the rotation, and then we're feeling that side bend and that forward bend to get you into that position, which in turn takes care of your early extension and all these other things that 
you know, nobody, nobody, well, very few people would have the club in a really beautiful position and then just choose to stand up and out of their posture. It all happens from things that have happened earlier in the golf swing, right? So if we can kind of understand that if we can keep that sweet spot behind you, your body's going to want to turn, right? You're going to want to stay in your posture better unless you're injured or you have some other kind of limitation in that sense. Mm-hmm. And that's where, you know, once you kind of get these feelings, then putting them into almost one motion, right? So we let it fall as we bend and side bend. And then by, you're kind of, you start to feel mm-hmm. that golf club working in and behind you in that sense. Yeah. Um, I need to now ask, because people are like, right, I'll do this two or three times just to humor Mark and Emma, Emma a little bit. And um, now I'm going to grab my driver and just go as hard as I can and hope I get it right. Yeah. And I can see you rolling your eyes at folks. Um, let's take this beautiful drill and now add a little movement to it and get the golf ball being collected by the club as you're doing this advice. Well, and that's exactly, you know, so, you know, as we, so, you know, we get up to the top, we kind of feel this full and the, the club doesn't have to shallow, obviously it doesn't have to be horizontal to the ground, right? We're just trying to incline it in that direction because as soon as I start turning, it's going to steepen it back out again, right? That's what's going to bring it back out in front of me. So I only need to feel a little bit of this motion but for the average golfer that's used to pulling the handle down so hard, this could feel like this little bit of club shallowing, this softness in your hands could feel extremely different. You know, the old feel versus real that you see all the time or you hear all the time. So as we kind of get it up here, kind of feeling full as it rotates and we side bend down, and then all of a sudden that club is working from the inside. Now again, caveat to everything, there's gonna take, it's gonna take a bit of time for your brain to reorganize how the weight transfers and where my body needs to be to get my low point back to where it has to be. Because if I'm used to being steep and standing and flipping, this is now going to be a little bit different. And that's why the drills take time and then the slow motion reps take time. And then we speed it up a little bit because you have to retrain the pieces to kind of move back to where impact is. I, I'm guessing you'd advocate that folks would sort of start with a ball on a tee and like a, some sort of seven iron or something in hand. And as they yeah. as they start to collect the ball, so I'm doing this, then you start to gradually lower the tee a touch. Exactly. Because, you know, when you, as soon as you start shallowing the club, essentially, if you're somebody, especially that has quite an aggressive slice or an over the top move, that's a lot steeper. So yeah. this, you know, if you don't get the body rotating through enough, you're probably going to have a hard time making you're going to hit the ground behind mm-hmm, yeah. like the yeah you're going to hit the ground behind quite a lot so the ball up on the tee and feeling the softness that is required for you to move through get the weight through and through into that kind of balanced finish up on your lead side i think you're right starting with seven iron even starting slow and even starting in the three pieces kind of feel the fall feel the rotation feel the down and the ball might only go five yards it doesn't have to go far we're just, again, piece by piece by piece, putting this all together until we can kind of make it. So you feel confident that you can make it go a little faster because I guarantee if you move on too quickly, you're going to pull that club down. And as much as you feel like you're rotating inside, bending the clubs out in front of you and you've got nothing yet, you've got no chance. Okay. Folks, here's my two cents worth. It's sensational, this drill. That's why that's why I called up, why I texted, why I messaged Emma. Um I would just rec- recommend you practice this in front of a mirror and start yeah. to feel it some and start to trust the fact that gravity is there to get the club down to the ground and you really there in support of the thing, not man. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, it's funny. I used to have to do this. Uh, I'll tell a quick little story here. I used to have to do this drill with my coach growing up. I was taught by Ian Triggs, who he used to teach John Send and Kyra Webb. And he's all about, feel everything was always about feel and if I if I hit a bad shot he went straight to the mental side of things not the physical side of things and I had a tendency to get tight with my grip and pull the club down and my ball flight would get a little cutty and he lived in Australia I was in America and he happened to be over working with John Senden at a PJ tour event in New Jersey so I flew from wherever we were out to New Jersey and um, met him on a driving range and all he had me do the the hour that we were together basically or a couple of hours that we were together was hold the club basically as soft as I could. I call it the overcooked spaghetti drill. You hold it as loose as you can and just feel it work back, feel your body rotate, feel the club work down and just, again, 
making the golf swing a little bit more body based, a little bit less arm based. And I was like flushing it again. And I thought, oh God, I flew, flew all the way to New Jersey <laughs> to, to do this, but it, it worked perfectly. Well, yeah. that's the thing. I mean, folks got to realize everything's happening so fast. Sometimes the slightest, the slightest little bird can throw the cat amongst the pigeons. And I tell you yeah. what, if you want to see a beautiful personification of what Emma said, is go and YouTube John Senden's golf swing. Oh, yeah. That looks like he's painting. The club's moving so beautifully smooth, yeah. like silk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, All that's right. a whole nother level of relaxation there. Yeah, okay. Uh, we've taken a long time to get through the first drill. It's all on me. Let's go to the second one. The towel behind the ball. This uh, seems to help the angle of attack a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's pretty good. basic. It's um, it's essentially yeah, just just training your low point control. Something that is so important in the golf swing, and you know, it it can have a, a beautiful golf swing. It can look as, as pretty as you want it to be, but if you can't deliver the golf club back to the golf ball consistently, even if you know a slower swinger is going to have to have a shallower angle of attack, so that it doesn't it doesn't mean that the the towel doesn't have to be you know, half an inch behind the golf ball and you've got to feel like you're coming down so steep. It's just basically, again, so if you put a towel, call it, I don't know, we're hitting a seven iron, let's put it four or five inches behind the golf yeah, ball. A couple, three inches over, yeah. let's say, right? Okay. Yeah, so, and you're, you know, if you if you hang back on your back foot, if you flip your wrists early, if you do all these things, I mean, you're going to hit the towel. So it's a, it's a drill that gives you instant feedback. And I think that's something that, a lot of amateurs miss when they practice is feedback. How do you know if you're doing anything different? How do you know if your hands are higher, if your impact is better, if your club is different, if you're not, if there's no feedback except for what you feel, because our body kind of lies to us sometimes with what we feel a little bit. So uh, so kind of putting that towel behind there and giving you that feedback, feeling the weight shift, feeling the weight get back to your lead side, I think is just a really helpful one. Yeah, folks, what Emma's talking about here is just taking a towel and lying it on the ground as if it's a mat. And you get yeah. it behind the golf ball looking down the target line. I've used this. I actually have a towel, <clears throat> forgive me, that has stripes in it, like pinstripes, but broad. Yeah. And I set those up so the stripes are going in the same direction as the target line. So it kind of gives one special bearings too. So on your approach, if you're wanting to cut across the thing like you reference, it's going to be carving across these lines in a crooked map. Yeah. So it's just an added thing. But but it's a great drill to do because if you do happen to strike the towel, you're not hurting yourself or, or having anything adverse happening. Yeah, exactly. It's just that instant kind of, oh, I must have. And it could be whatever it is that your swing fault is. I must have hung back on my back foot. I must have scooped my hand. I must have done whatever it is that you're working on, I assume, with your coach, hopefully with your coach. You know, got to get my club face in a stronger position so I can transfer my weight so I can keep that angle better. You know, and and I know I did it or I didn't do it. Yes, and and talk about this, please. I had this conversation with someone, and I was like, give yourself the right in practice to practice ugly. It's not supposed to oh, be yeah. looking out there because you're trying to do something new most of the time. So you're not out there putting on a clinic as to how to strike the golf ball. Yes. Yeah, exactly. It's you know, if if you're trying to if you're trying to change something in your golf swing and you're not willing to move outside of what is comfortable, outside of your comfort zone, maybe even look a little bit stupid. If you're worried of what people are going to think, I can pretty well guarantee that nobody cares what you're doing on the driving range. They only care how they're hitting it. Exactly. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's sort of, you know, if you're, you're never going to change if, if you're too worried to try something new and you have to, I mean, you see, and this is what I show, I show uh, my students all the time is when you see tour players, doing drills on the driving range and you see these crazy exaggerations of things. And I'm like, well, mm -hmm. Rory's swing does not look like that. Tiger does not do this. Alex Norrin, I think he doesn't do that what crazy move that left. <laughs> like, yeah. It's it's not actually, and it's trying to, to separate. This is the feel that we're trying to get. It's not going to actually look like that, but you have to allow yourself to experiment of what that feels like in order to kind of see potential change. Lovely. Okay, this one sounds interesting to me. Palm to palm, folks, and this is not like the trees you find on the coast of Florida or in Queensland or somewhere. Um, talk, show, show us palm to palm and explain the value thereof, please. So this one's all about all about the rotation in the backswing. So I'll jump up again for those watching and I'll explain it for those that are not. But if I hop into my golf posture and I put my arm straight out to the side, uh -huh. okay, and if I try and make my lead hand, so for me, my left hand as a right-handed golfer, touch my right palm okay if I don't turn 
no tense. Elbow. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yep. If I kind of reverse pivot this way, no tense. I actually have to rotate, keep the weight on the inside of my trail leg in order for that to actually kind of those two palms to meet. So I'm keeping my right arm out exactly where it is. It's locked in and I'm just taking my left hand and I am making it meet my right palm. And you can sort of see there from this angle here, it requires me to, like I said, you have to keep, because even if I get here and I sway to the outside of my right foot, uh -huh. I'm never going to get there. So it's, it's a very simple, I try to give people drills that they can do at home because as much as we have the best of intentions, the weeks go by and we don't get time to go to the range. So if somebody can stand up here in their house while their microwave is going and they're waiting for something and they can do this drill and feel these palms touch one another and feel this rotation, feel what's required by the hips and the, the upper body and not this kind of moving back and forth. Perfect. You're getting some kind of feedback. So it's just a it's a really simple way. And I think it's one of the one of the very few drills that you can't really cheat. I mean, you probably like you probably can. People can probably find a way, but it's pretty well rock solid. I yeah, think. I think it's kind of foolproof. Um to describe to folks what Emma is doing. She's basically in her golf posture. She's stretched her arms out to her side, not rigid, but stretched. And then her palms are facing outwards. And then you're yeah. trying to rotate your lead palm all the way into the backswing. So it touches the trail palm. Now, yeah, if you without slide, moving your trail arm. If, if yeah. you slide your hips, if anything happens, you're not going to get to the palm. You might hit yourself in the arm. What about the three swing yeah. side? Applicable? Um, not so much. I kind of like people to feel. So once we've, once we've kind of gotten to this position, now you feel what it's like to get that weight loaded in the trail yeah. side. Yeah. Then I kind of start to like to feel that little bit of a fall back to the lead side and the rotate around. But so the arm gets often, in the wrong way some. Yeah, that's it, right? So we're kind of here. We feel this bit of, you know, so, so we do the drill. We get ourselves into the backswing, feel the fall back into the lead side. So the fall of the, the call it the weight mm -hmm. moving back into the lead side. And then just feel the arms kind of fall as you rotate around. So you you kind of, again, if we don't have a solid backswing rotation, well, we're always going to do something weird in the downswing. So if we can kind of get ourselves in a good position here, feel what it's like to then kind of let that weight move through, do it. Like I, said, I, I find myself doing random things like that all the time, just at home when I'm waiting for the dog or whatever it is, right? This these it? little things that can kind of start to build and train the muscles the way we need them to work. It looks very much, I have visions in my head of Michael Phelps getting ready for a race, you know, we used to. Oh, yeah. Everybody. It looks to me like it's a great way to just improve some sort of mid back mobility and stuff as well when you're doing that. Yeah. And if you can't, if you can't do it, if you can't get those palms to meet because you can't rotate enough, mm -hmm. well, there's obviously some kind of limitation there. Yeah. Whether it's your hips, whether it's your lower back, whether it's your thoracic spine, whatever it is, but A, at least it identifies it. And then B, don't try and swing all the way back in your golf swing because you're probably going to lift your arms and you're going to do something else again to compensate. So always swinging within yourself and and what you have the ability to do so if you do a drill without a golf club and you can't get your back to the target let's just say well there's no point trying when you have a golf club in your hand it's not going to get easier by any means okay let's bring some truth serum to the viewer slash listener if you gave 100 lessons how many of those make fake back swings oh i would say 70 Wow, you're doing better than me. I would have said it was probably more. And, and I asked yeah. that, folks, just to know, because Emma makes such a beautiful point that if you do have some mobility issues you, you and you can't naturally get properly get your arms to the top of the backswing and the club parallel, in the effort to go there, we just start breaking stuff down and compensating. And then you've got to organize all that mess going on on the way back to the golf ball. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and I, I love that there's some golf swings out there now that are a little less you know, quote unquote conventional. Mm -hmm. There's your John Rahms and even your Matt Wolfs, people that are all over the shop at the top of the backswing. Not that I would ever teach that, but at least it starts to tell, like kind of sends the message that you don't have to be perfectly at parallel at the top of the backswing, like Tiger Woods, like Adam Scott, Rory, like whoever, to have an efficient golf swing. And that's kind of all we're trying to do is make it as efficient as we can. And the more pieces that you introduce in an environment that maybe isn't conducive to it. So if you try and overturn and you therefore lift, you're going to have to do something on the way down and you're just adding another element 
of timing that you're going to have again people all people want is to be more consistent so we've yeah, got to take away I mean. yeah. the moving parts as much as we can mm -hmm. the next one this is number four of five the fifth one folks stay tuned for uh, i'll <laughs> tease it it's the driver off the deck um i i think i know why you do this podrick harrington does it often oh does he um, yeah um but the first before that you got a head cover or whatever it might be on the ground to control the exit path. And look, I love exercises where it's not necessarily that you have something kind of on your body that's telling you what to do, but it's saying, hey, we're going to miss this area. So it's not like you're trying to hit the ball, you're trying to miss an area and you're directing your swing in a certain direction. So describe the yeah. head cover, please. I mean, and it, and it can really work for if you're struggling with a hook or if you're struggling with a slice, because it just depends on, you know, or that, that would dictate where you would put the, the head cover. I often use an impact bag or something like that. But on your, you know, if you kind of look down your target line and if you're somebody that's struggling with a slice, because what I found, the more lessons I taught was I could teach people how to drop the club and I could feel like they're doing a good job. But because they're so used to maybe pulling the hands really close to their body on the way through, mm -hmm. then we'd actually end up just kind of almost hitting like toe shanks because the club is dropping but then they're still pulling it in and then the club mm -hmm. can't hit the golf ball and then I started to kind of realize that if you actually make the obstacle I guess that you're trying to avoid post impact the brain goes well god I can't pull the club in because I'm going to smash this head cover this bag this whatever so I have to let my hands exit more to the right or let my hands exit more to the left and the the downswing starts to take a little bit more kind of care of itself because logically speaking you're not going to throw the club out in front of you if there's something forward and left of your golf ball that you're trying to avoid. And so that's kind of where, yeah, you, you would put your golf ball down, you'd put the head cover, or like I said, I use an impact bag, just head of and left or head of and right of your target line. Mm -hmm. And you're just basically trying to swing and miss the target line. And it it seems to be what I have found, again, given that the club face is in alignment, and sometimes it Sometimes it just lines up. Sometimes people get it. Sometimes it takes a little bit more, but it kind of helps even the feeling of where we sort of need the body to be to get that to happen. Absolutely. Um, on Emma's Instagram handle, I'll let her share it at the end of this conversation. Um, you have, you, you were actually demonstrating to somebody with a yellow impact bag. I remember that. And you had yeah. this client, uh, some learner, guy who started indoors and he was very trapped with the arms up at the top big sort of heave over the top and chop across it and then, oh yeah i don't know how long it was later but next thing this guy's aiming right hitting draws around a stick you got down the driving range there um yeah that you use this this drill with him so exactly yeah and and you know it took us he's actually the perfect example of somebody that really just trusted the process you know we've been working together for about a year and couldn't get the club face anywhere near closing enough to even think about not hitting a, a cut. It hit it, like a shank in the first video you posted. It was indoors. Yeah, it was, yeah. it was crazy. I think the club path on track man was negative 12 or something like it was, you know, as a coach, I looked at it first time I met him and I was like, Ooh, like that, <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> that's a big hill you have to climb. But and that was he he was sort of my aha moment with that so we worked a lot on getting the club face closing getting the club face matching the path first so that he could actually start to trust swinging a little bit more out to the right but even yeah. when we just put the bag there initially and i had him just making some practice swings around it the feeling was so different to what he was used to that it was kind of like i saw the light bulb go off in his head which mm -hmm. then made me realize because we don't the average amateur golfer doesn't need you to necessarily go into in-depth information about the golf swing and the way that the body's going to, you know, need to align and, and all these, I don't know, I think there's a place for it when coaches are talking to coaches. But when I'm trying to just explain to a 20 handicap golfer that I need his club path to go more right, the easiest way to do it is just to put something in the way and say, swing around it. And the the light bulb went off. And, and so then that's something I've used whether somebody's hitting a hook or whether they're hitting a slice, because you, like I said, you just change the orientation of the the bag or the or the club. Yeah. 
take yeah. that off. It's amazing. There's this hit the ball impulse thing too for a lot of golfers. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, you're supposed to get the ball there. And if you're not hitting the ball properly, the next thing, they abandon par face relationships and they just like strike this thing. But you're so right. Well, and you, I think if you can show them where they got to go or where they shouldn't go, then that sort of organizes the mindset to swing instead of hit. Exactly. And, and I think that's why there's such value in learning golf when you're younger, because like we're as you as you get older, you you get more careful, generally speaking. So if you hit a few bad shots in a row, if you're a kid and you hit a few bad shots in a row, you don't care. You're just going to keep hacking at this thing until you get it and you're going to move your body and you're going to not worry about anything. What I find, I guess, with with adults is if it doesn't come right away, it's almost like this fear factor creeps in that yeah. they've lost it all together and, and then you end up gravitating back again towards what's what's comfortable. So it's the hit instinct, exactly like you said, is so real that we need to find ways almost around. I wish there was something where we could have no golf ball and an imaginary golf ball just pops up and they <laughs> hit it so that they don't have time for their brain to go oh, and try and, you know, yeah. try and manipulate it. The, yeah. That, yeah yes that would be awesome i mean nick felder said to me one stage he goes if he had it to do all over again he'd practice more in front of a mirror and not just not hit golf balls yeah i've kept you for too long we well past our deadline so here the driver off the deck explain it tell the folks why and for the folks listening this is more for the um advanced golfer although i would counter that it's not a bad idea for anybody because it'll build a fairly decent base of the swing art. yeah it's um it's something yeah i've i've mainly tried it with um whether they're higher speed golfers or people that hit big hooks because yeah. if you try and have a club path that is too shallow with a driver off the deck you're going to miss it you're going to top it there's the absolutely yeah, yeah there's absolutely no chance and often when somebody's hitting a hook or, or even if they're struggling with their weight shift and their weight transfer, you know, and the upper body kind of hangs back and the weight stays too far back, this kind of, you know, it doesn't take that many shots for the light bulb to go off and go, oh, I better get my chest covering this golf ball better. I get, I better get the club moving out a little bit more. I better get my impact a little bit, I guess, steeper yeah. in mm -hmm. order to be able to make contact with this golf ball. I think, you know, I think hitting a, a draw with a driver off the deck is a difficult thing to do, but hitting a little low cut with it off the deck is a very doable thing. And I think it, again, without getting so in the weeds technically with people, it can bring feels because, well, if you don't do it right, you miss it. So I better exaggerate it more. I better exaggerate it more. And then all of a sudden, like I said, these pieces start to align a little bit better. Yeah. Well, look, to kind of put a bow on that, with that hit the ball thing, that the impulse that we sort of all have, if you're very ball conscious with this, you'll start to realize the driver very much kind of has to sweep the ground. And it reminds me, we talked about the potential Mount Rushmore of golf instructors. Well, I would say Harvey Pennick would likely be on that, if not an honorable mention. And he mm -hmm. had a modified golf club. It was a shaft with a weed cutter, a long blade on the bottom of it. And if you had issues, uh -huh. yeah, it's at a long blade like this at the end of the thing. He'd put it down, go, he goes, Go chop the grass around the place. Just go and lop the top of the grass, the weeds off. Because very quickly, you start to swing that thing like your driver deal. Because yeah. now you're thinking about the swing and how the base moves and how you've got to support that as opposed to, well, hit this thing on the ground somehow, you know. Well, and, and that's, you know, I think, again, breaking it into something a little bit more logical yeah. instead of, I need you to transfer this and then I need you to feel the weight shift here and then I need you to let the club fall but I also need you to close the face but then I also need you to and then by the time you finish the person is so like paralyzed by all the things that you've said where if it's like like that here's the driver hit the ball yes you want them to understand what they're doing and that's important but you also need need to sometimes make it a little bit simpler and that's why there's umpteen million training aids out there that exist because all we're trying to do is make the feel a little bit easier to come by, I suppose. Emma, you have just perfectly encapsulated everything I said about you when we started. I'm like, you bring a playing influence to this. Your information is great. The drills are awesome. Um, and you're right. It's essentially at the bottom of the genesis of it all. 
it's a game of spin. You have a bat designed to propel spin the ball, and you've got to move it in such a fashion to spin it in a desired manner. And all this stuff and, you know, dorsiflexion and don't uh. there go. Yeah, no, it's too much. And this is, again, what I loved about what you're doing. And uh, I think the sky's the limit. So with that being said, let's direct folks to your website, if you have one, or at least the social media, please. Where do they go? Yeah, so you can find me at Emma DeGroote Golf on Instagram. That's kind of where I do most of my most of my stuff. Um, not super active on Twitter or any really other platform. I'm more of a watcher than an actual poster. So at Emma DeGroote Golf on Instagram. That's where the old people like me go to uh, X. I love I love to read it, but I'm I'm not super active in actually posting. But uh, but Instagram at Emma DeGroote Golf is where you can find me. And you got that very cool logo I see on your T-shirt. Yeah. Yeah. So it looks like a kangaroo inside of a O or a Q or a C. What is it? Uh, yeah, just an oval. So it was sort of, you know, we were trying to come up with something and I wanted to to keep it Australian because I'm a very proud Australian, even though I don't live there. And then the circle kind of, I don't know, in some ways it sort of represents the golf swing. It also just looked nice and went with the kangaroo kind of <laughs> kind of a feel. But but yeah, that's that's my logo. And I started my own business, like I said, at the beginning of this year, which has been awesome. The feedback has been great and so i'm yeah i'm excited to see where where, where we go from here well i'm wearing my favorite teacher t-shirt <laughs> was given just for me. me i knew you know what i i was wondering what it said under favorite and now i know it's teacher favorite. and it was for me so thank i appreciate you. that <laughs> Listen, thank you for joining us it was great um do keep in touch you're doing sensational work folks go check out emma she's wonderful at what she does thank you thank you very much thank you for having me